to uh, to get a, a broader discussion on that, but we we continue to work on that. But I do support the idea. I've talked with Wolf Ending several times myself, and uh, he's done some excellent research. In fact, some of the, the facts that I use comes from his research. So, uh, and and what's common between what we've talked about with health savings accounts and, and Lowell Fennick's approach is that the people are empowered with money, so they're, they're cousins. You know, his is a little bit more robust approach than what I've been talking about. But as far as what we can do legislatively, there's, this, is, this is really a cultural change. It's legislative and cultural. We, we need to quit thinking that someone else is going to pay for our medical bills, and we need to think that how can we have more of the, 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 the premium money come to in our personal accounts, we'll still have insurance. We're not talking about doing away with insurance, but it's for the unexpected. That's what insurance is for, is for the unexpected. But we, if we can fund our health savings accounts where we become empowered, uh, so that, that's a cultural thing that employees can ask their employers, well, why don't you fund my health savings account? I'll take a little higher deductible policy. You know, Bob Nonini was here tonight. He could talk about a couple of his uh, customers that, that have done that, they've reduced their costs, they've, they've funded health savings accounts, and everybody wins. It's win, win, win. Uh, the, the other thing that, that, well, there's several things we probably do, but the one that comes into my mind is we need to make sure that through, uh, that insurance companies aren't doing price fixing through contracts with providers. If they say that uh, if a provider gives a, a cash price, that, that then the insurance company gets to have the, that cash price, because cash price, so we just need to make sure that's not getting written into contracts. So there's a couple of things we can do, and, I, uh, and I'm trying to get to the bottom of the one I'm talking about, but I haven't quite yet. First thing we got to do is stop doing what we're doing, and that's taking Idaho taxpayer money and propping up a failing redistribution of wealth system called Obamacare. <laughs> Should not put another dime or another man hour into this system. <coughs> and we should chart an alternative course. I think Phoenix got a good idea. The uh, healthcare savings accounts got a good idea. Idahoans, once again, should be in charge of the healthcare system in the state of Idaho. The federal government does not have the best interest of the citizens of this state at mind, and uh, the first thing we do is, is stop doing what we're doing and start implementing some of those things that uh, Olfanik has suggested. And by the way, yes, we can create that alternative path within the state legislature and state of Idaho. Thank you, so uh, now we'll get back to a few more questions here in a minute, uh, but we want to touch one more issue here. Uh, from what I understand, MP squared is empowering people to prosper. How exactly does MP squared empower people to prosper? And we'll start with Senator Fulcher and work around. We've got incredible resources in this state. We've got human resources. We have natural resources. The problem is we're not letting people use them. It's like getting into a boxing ring and saying you got to keep your hands tied behind your back. We have to be able to get access to the resources that we have. One of the things we have not talked about, but it's a direct, uh, directly connected to what Dirk just asked, is, is the natural resources in the state. 63% of the lands within our borders, for the most part, we can't touch. And that's created a lose-lose scenario. Because take timber, for example. If you can't touch it, there's, it's prone to disease, it's prone to the undergrowth and the fires as a result of that. The next thing you know, we're, we're spending our money to suppress fires, deal with the, with the environmental fallout on the airshed and the watershed, and, and we're taking our, our money, what we do have, to, to uh, deal with a decaying asset, but in reality, if, if we just get access to a portion of that, which I would argue should have been ours at statehood in the first place, just to get access to it. <laughs> the economic benefit and the empowerment that comes by just letting people 
have access to the assets within the borders is incredible. So that's how we empower people. We give them access to what they already should have access to. <coughs> that's called empowerment. And there's productivity and prosperity that comes with that. That's an excellent question, actually. And I think it has lots of different ways it could be answered. But I'm going to take one, one aspect of that. Um, and that has to do with entitlements. You know, Medicaid is a huge budget item. It's about $1.9 billion in the state of Idaho. And of that, 70% of it's federal money. But because a lot of it's federal money, there's the <laughs> rules associated with that so that our hands are tied. I think we need to have some long-term thinking about how we can start replacing Medicaid with a private charity care system and that uh, we can get to the point where we can self-fund Medicaid. The state can provide its own funding. I won't go through the whole, the whole concept right now, but just if we got to that point, what people really need that are, that, uh, are on Medicaid, that, that uh, they need some help, they need some mentors, they need someone to sit down with them and help them decide what their long-term goals in life are and help them reach them. That's what we're really talking about is here is empowering people to reach their life goals. But the way Medicaid is set up right now, if you earn ten dollars or one penny over what they say you can earn, you don't. You, all your benefits are cut away. There's no off ramp, and so it traps people in dependency. That's the tendency. That's one of the things that we're talking about. Is let's create a different system, maybe a parallel system for a while, but one where where we can help people with mentors, lifetime limits, uh, improvement plans, so they can reach the goals that they set for themselves. Yeah, I want to make talk about a, a couple states that have taken a different path in, in how they go about things. Two states that I'm sure you're all very familiar with, um, but both California and Texas have uh, a lot of natural resources. Uh, most people would argue that California is, is much more attractive, uh, just from a, a scenic viewpoint, a much more attractive place to live, and. One thing that I just learned is they have about the same amount of known oil reserves. Uh, Texas has decided to go ahead and develop theirs, while California has taken the opposite path of deciding to try to increase prosperity by government spending. <laughs> well, which state do you think is doing better? Over the, since 2006, the economy of California has actually shrunk. Mm -hmm. uh, not, not have they just had no growth, they've had negative growth. And in, since 2006, Texas has averaged 7% growth per year. <coughs> the state of North Dakota, which is much closer to us and we also know, does not have as much oil reserves as California, but has taken a very aggressive approach to developing it. They're growing at a rate of 13% a year. Now, as far as we know, Idaho doesn't have much oil, but we have discovered some natural gas. As Senator Fulcher mentioned, we have lots of timber here, and we also have lots of metals and minerals in this state that uh, we could take a more aggressive approach to developing and one of, the, one of the things that I think that a lot of people don't understand is that, and, and one of the tenets of MP squared is that production is the only way to, to truly generate wealth. Uh, One of, one of the, I don't know if it was Nancy Pelosi or somebody else said that one of the, the biggest ways to increase the wealth of this country was to spend more money on unemployment. <laughs> but it, it shows a, a fundamental lack of disagreement and, and 
on how economics works. But true wealth comes from producing something. And if we're producing, whether that's taking something out of the ground and making it more useful, or taking two things that have already come from the ground and putting them together and making something more useful. That's the true means of production, and Idaho should in, encourage that, and in, in many ways we do, but we can do better. As you can see, there are plenty of ideas out there, and uh, many of the legislators, the senators, and representatives in Boise are <coughs> discussing them, sharing them, and working on them. We're the minority. If it wasn't the case, then we would have a lot of this already accomplished. That's not to say that it's not important that we continue to discuss and share these ideas, even if the media doesn't want to discuss them, even if in, in your mind there's, there's not, no action because the media, the news media is not talking about it. One of the primary things that I'm concerned about, not just in terms of uh, this uh, consumer mentality that we all have, is the social and financial concerns. We all know, for instance, I talked to a gentleman the other night, his insurance, he's self-employed, his insurance is going up $4,000 in premiums, are going up $4,000 a year. He's outraged. What can I do about that, he wants to know. Well, that's going to be a tall order to try and stop. The bell has been rung. The financial ramifications of what we're talking about with respect to potential Medicaid expansion, what we're already seeing with the Obamacare expansion, are going to be personal. They're going to affect each and every one of us personally. But I think about the social aspects of it. When I have a 20-something saying to me, why am I paying, why am I subsidizing your health care, old man? I don't mind the health care part, but the old man part bothers me. <laughs> but when they're asking this question, it occurs to me that the idea that death panels may or may not be written into this law, this mandate, is not even going to be relevant because in 20 years, the younger generation that is paying for the health care of the older generation is simply going to demand death panels. They're going to demand it. They're going to say, that's it. We're not, we're cutting you off. You don't need transplants, none of this, none of this stuff. You're 65 years old, you're no longer productive. And that's pretty young to me these days. <laughs> So we're not just talking about finance, we're not just talking about uh, uh, education and the ramifications there, we're talking about social strife. And that's why we're motivated to work on this and continue to work on this despite the odds in Boise that we may prevail if we just continue and you stay vocal and stay active in this realm. Stay active and don't disengage. Stay active and stay verbal. It's so essential if we're going to get anything productive done. I'd like to follow up on that excellent comment by uh, Representative Barbieri. Uh, you, you know, you might think as we go down the state legislature that we're down there trying to figure out how to help the people of the state. And to some extent that's true. But our main focus is to protect the agencies, make sure they have enough money to, to fund Medicaid. Speak for yourself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. But, the atmosphere, <laughs> but, but that's, that's the, Don't do that. <laughs> the, the arguments being made, it's all in this redistribution of wealth fish tank. So when we make these arguments that hey, we, don't, we need to look at this differently, they say, well, you're just mean-spirited. No, we're not mean-spirited. We're, we're, we're trying to do it a different way. So we're trying to change the culture of the legislature. So when we go down there, we say, yeah, everybody can benefit. But we can't benefit by doing what we've been doing. That's what we're trying to do. And you can help us out by, uh, by hopefully we're explaining what, what we're trying to do and, and share that with your, other, with your legislators. And if I can. I have a, just a quick comment on that, okay. and that goes back to, to Mary Sousa's question about what can we do, and, and I don't remember what politician it was, I think it was President Reagan, said, if you can't make him see the light, make him feel the heat, <laughs> and that's your guys' job. Thank you, Senator. Um, I think what we'll do is uh, I want to see 
we'll check with the crowd here if you guys have any questions and we'll kind of move quickly along the panel. I, 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 I will get to you. Hold, hold on one second. We'll, we'll move quickly kind of through the answers, keep it to about a minute or so just in the interest of time. And I do have an urgent question in the back that I've been waiting on for a while. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Senators and Congressmen, for coming down to uh, Coeur d'Alene. Uh, pre really appreciate it. Uh, I just had a question. MP squared, is that a legislative platform somewhat similar to uh, the Contract with America in 1995? Is that, is that what we're, it's uh, uh, addressing an education reform, uh, PAPACA, Obamacare, and uh, na our, our, our natural resources in this state? Is that, is that what we're talking about? Uh, just to reiterate for those who, if you didn't hear it, the question is just in regards to MP squared, is that an actual legislative package that you guys intend to enact? And we'll start with Senator Fulcher here, and we'll, uh, we'll just move through the panel quickly. This is an attempt to try to shift the, the culture to what we believe, what I believe, I won't speak for everyone, what I believe was divinely inspired in this nation, and that's one of self self uh, uh, dependency for incentive and to allow the, the free market to operate so that we can continue to produce and to prosper and uh, so so i would describe it as a, a uh, uh, try uh, an attempt to try to shift the culture back to where it needs to be and i'd answer the question that uh, i don't think we're quite yet to the stage where we i mean we have some legislation we're talking about but we're, we're still in our infancy. We're still discussing what MP squared is. So, uh, but I think at some point we could come out and say we have some legislative agendas we would like to see. We can share them with you, uh, but we're not quite there yet. I don't have anything to add to that. <laughs> the only thing I have to add is that it's a, it's a mindset and it's a perspective and we're working to change that mindset and that perspective in Boise. And if we can prevail upon that, then we will see uh, legislation moving in this direction. Thank you. Uh, yes, you did have a question. What is it, sir? Yes, Let's, let's give them an opportunity to answer. The question was uh, basically how as a state can we deal with the, the national debt and the influence of the Federal Reserve? Um, I don't know who wants to take that question first. We will try and, try and keep it. It's like, don't let me get started. <laughs> the issue of a state bank is complex, and I, I understand one of the Dakotas has done it very successfully. But it, 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 it raises a lot of issues in terms of competition with the private banks and, and this kind of thing. Uh, there's n the Federal Reserve, if we listen to Janet Yellen's uh, uh, confirmation hearings, the Federal Reserve is going to stay on the same path that it stayed on. It's going to continue. It will expand QE, infinity. There is no exit strategy. And she's made that pretty clear. So. You know, slight digression, but, but directly on point. If this is going to continue, which it looks like it will, Idaho will have nothing to say when they come to foreclose on the mines, when they come to foreclose on the, on the uh, forests. The creditors will take Idaho assets. I suggest that if you're thinking about personal pain with respect to Medicaid and Obamacare, this will cause personal pain. And my message is prepare accordingly. Thank you, Representative. Would anybody else like to take that question? I want to address it from a slightly different angle, and that is uh, 
the acknowledgement that the gentleman made in regard to the debt that our nation is facing. And to me, that's a, it's one of those things that just creates the urgency because the state of Idaho does have a balanced budget. And so for the most part, we've been somewhat wise stewards in the scheme of things. And the federal government is 17 trillion in debt. Well, we are, we are intertwined. Our policies are intertwined. That's because, because uh, uh, the federal government is involved with education, it's involved with health care, it's involved with transportation funding, all those things. And irrespective of the debate on the state banks, the Federal Reserve, and so on, I think the general policy needs to be that the state of Idaho needs to, to loosen that tether, that fiscal tether between the state and the federal government. Because when that, when that major debt ship sinks, we are tethered to it. And that goes back full circle to the previous discussion that we were having. It's, it has to do with the empowerment of people. How do you do that? You, you get access to the resources within your borders. And I think that just underscores the need to be able to get access to the resources that we have so that we can empower our people, so that we can produce, so that we can prosper, so that we can loosen that fiscal tether. So the next time the federal government comes forward with a program and offers some carrot out there in the form of grant, we can fiscally say, thanks, but no thanks. I just like to add one little thing, a couple of the questions out there, and that is, we can look at the future as um, like a stump in the field and we go run into it, we can't figure out how to get around it, or we can move forward and uh, if we're going to turn this country around, it's going to be turned around by what we're talking about. So we're doing what we can do. If we do a state bank or not, that will reveal itself as, as the time comes. Thank you, Senator. There's a question here. She just wanted to ask. Okay, go ahead. Um, just a quick question. Um, everything that you're saying about the federal government and Question then, um, where is the accountability? Yes. Is, is yes. that the question? Yes. Okay. I see the structure, I see the changes that the okay. legislation made. Where's the accountability for the software people? Sure. Let, let's, uh, who would like to take that first? Senator Vick? I'll, I'll start with that because you mentioned the, the Unified Land Use Code. And, and this is the why I think it's important that we, we move things as close to the, the people as possible. Because although the, that issue is not dead, because of the overwhelming response that the county commissioners got in this county from people who were opposed to the Unified Land Use Code, it is at least paused and is being redirected. And, and that's something where you held them accountable to their decision we got educated on the issue, held them accountable. I have, I have the exact same frustration that you do with Congress that they do not hold the, the president accountable. 
I don't have an immediate answer for that problem, but the, the long term is, is we need to continue to devolve government down to a more local level. That's the way our, our country was designed and founded, and we need to get back to that, and then it's much easier to hold those people accountable. <laughs> Quickly. See, no. Uh, real quick, we just have a time for one or two more questions, and I'll get to you, sir. I want to get to the gentleman. Oh, go ahead then. The, uh, I'd like to uh, respond to the gentleman's question about the Federal Reserve. Is there anything being done on the state level to uh, imitate what states like Utah have, have passed? recently with the gold and the silver being a legal tender. I understand Texas. The, the question is, is there, yeah, is there anything that... Uh, That's one way to defund the criminal we, ambition of we, the federal government. We have, uh, uh, Representative Pete Nielsen and I worked on a draft of a sound money bill uh, almost identical to that, which is Utah. It's very difficult for us to get uh, leadership to come on board with that. As sound and reasonable as it sounds to me, uh, that's it's crazy to them. So we've got some work to do there. We will be working on it this session, and we hope that we can garner enough votes to get uh, uh, a hearing. Thank you, Representative. Anybody else on that question? Senator Dirk for me, and uh, it takes me a moment, <laughs> but I don't think we adequately answered the question of this lady here, and at least. And I didn't respond. And so I want to try to, I wish I had a better response than I do. But if I could just say this, this republic and its foundation has a prerequisite. And that prerequisite is that our citizens are involved. And I, for one, should be thrown out if I don't stand for the things that I say I'm going to stand for, and if I don't uphold the best interests of the people in this state, that's the first priority. <laughs> to that end, I would go so far as to say the rest of us on this panel and anybody else who has an elected seat needs to be tossed out if we don't make that a priority. And for that, we need you. Hold us accountable. Just a short comment to answer the question also, because I don't feel like we answered your question very well either. But actually, you know, Senator Fulcher and I and Chad Inman have been organizing a six city tour partially in response to, to this frustration that we've all felt that we haven't been able to really let you know what's going on in the state of Idaho. This is a pre-legislative tour. We're trying to talk about the challenges we have. We've been fighting the governor on, on, on some of these issues. He hasn't been providing leadership. We feel like there's lack of opportunity. We could be moving in a certain direction that would empower people, but we're not. I feel like we're being run by corporations in the state of Idaho. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so mm -hmm. th this, this, uh, this is an attempt to get a, a sense of the people, let you know what, what we think is going on so we can change the debate and maybe hold people accountable. How successful it is? Depends totally on you. Thank you, Senator. We got a question here in the back. Uh, again, thank you for visiting us. It's very kind of you guys. Uh, mainly, my question would uh, be: Could you guys bring um, less corporate subsidies uh, down with you to Boise? All the tax exemptions, in specific, uh, are more. You know, we're giving more tax exemptions uh, for the corp like major corporations in the state than um, it would take to you know, pay for all our you know, major uh, problems with infrastructure and education. And would you guys really be able to uh, just be, really get the ball rolling on that kind of stuff? Uh, the question was basically to try and prevent the uh, To start, more ta uh, to end tax subsidies and tax credit for major corporations. Okay. If I may, I respectfully disagree with your characterization that uh, allowing tax exemptions are corporate welfare. Uh, my job is to try to lighten the tax load, try to 
lessen the bureaucratic burden and try and lessen the bureaucratic expense. If I can lessen the cost of government, then we don't need to tax as much. The key to what you're asking about with respect to educational funding lies in the two-thirds of the state that is under federal control. Those states that have control of their resources, all of their resources, have no problems funding education. They have no problems funding highways. The key is we need to get back the control of the, our forest land and the rest of the uh, resources in our state, and we can utilize those responsibly, and we can fund education to the, to the hill. Now, I'm not suggesting that we would increase the budget for education, but to, to characterize that uh, uh, allowing tax exemptions for the companies to be able to work as welfare is kind of turning it on its head. It's lessening their tax load. It's not giving them money like a welfare state would be giving them money. Senator Vick, do you want to tackle that real quick? Yeah, and I, I just wanted, when we talk about sales tax exemptions, which, which there are a lot in, in Idaho, that really is not any benefit to a corporation or a business other than for the, the paperwork, because all they do is collect it and turn it into the state. So if in Idaho, most services are not taxed. That really saves you money, not the company. Uh, if there's a sales tax exemption, that just means you don't pay the tax. So that's really no benefit to the company, and I just wanted to make sure that that, that point was clear. Income tax deductions is, is a little different, or exemptions is a little different story, but in that regard, I agree with Representative Barbieri. Would anybody else like to address that question? It's getting pretty close to the end, maybe one or two more questions and we better wrap it up. Well, I actually thought we would. I was trying to shoot for about 8.30, and I wanted to give you guys a chance to uh, just give a closing comment. And as this is the pre-legislative tour, um, just kind of final question in your closing comments. Uh, what do you guys see coming up in this next legislative session? And we'll start with Senator Fulcher. A preview of the next session. Um, well, the first and foremost, we'll, we'll spend three months fighting over your money, which is primarily what the legislature does. And, uh, uh, and so the budget is will always take front and center. I think you're going to see Common Core as a, a major, a major issue. I think that uh, uh, I'm going to predict we do not address the Medicaid expansion issue this year because I don't think most legislators want to deal with it in an election year. Uh, and I'll, I'll, uh, so although it's it's out there and it's the next major shoe to drop with the whole Obamacare debate, I'm going to guess that, that is not front and center. So I, I want to just mention that. The other thing that I expect to come around is um, uh, probably something on the public safety front. We have some corrections issues, uh, secure mental health and uh, correctional issues and, and the, the funding and the, and the systems, the accountability for those correctional systems. So just off the top of my head, I'd say those are going to be some of the major ones. Uh, I think there'll be some budget issues come up. I, I know there's uh, about $250 million of requests that I'm aware of. And so far, uh, the increase in tax revenue is not nearly $250 million more than last year. So there will be a lot of discussion about that. On the education, which I'll focus on mostly, is uh, I think Common Core, how data is being used, if we're going to use the Smart and Balanced Assessment, if we're, you know, if we're going to use the standards, uh, you know, the role of parents. There will be, be several issues uh, dealing with education. It might be more of an interesting session on education than it was two years ago. I'm not saying quite a bit. Yeah, they, they've hit most of the things. One of the things I wanted to do is Luke here, who's the chairman, had his hand up a couple times, and since he helped put this on, I think it would be fair. And if, I'll, I'll take I'll yield my time to answer whatever question it was that he had. Okay, well, first of all, I'm going to thank all of you for very generous. Uh, my action. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, 